Uh, at this point, I want to introduce Wendy Bernero. Uh, Wendy is someone who has been in this legal marketing business for a long time. I'll, I'll say at least 25 years. And she, she, can, she can tell you how long if she really wants to. Uh, she has run uh, marketing efforts at a number of top tier firms. Uh, uh, Paul Weiss, uh, McKee Nelson of late memory, sainted memory, uh, Aiken Gump and others. Uh, and we're delighted to have her here to do a case study. So Wendy. Can you hear me now? Oh, scared myself. Um, I get to bring together the pieces of what Tara and Jim just shared, all their great thoughts about what clients think and where we need to go, and uh, give you the example of a, of a project that I've been working on, and a pro type of project I've worked on at a number of firms, even actually one with Kevin Colangelo, who was my in-house colleague at one of the many firms I've been at, um, to just sort of share with you, so what do you do about all of this? What kind of project can you put together to get your firm to move forward in this direction? I have to say, in my career, I've been quite fortunate that at a number of firms, and now as a consultant, a number of clients, I have found chairmen or department heads who were absolutely determined to be the firm that Jim is talking about. A true belief that small amounts of incremental change were not making a difference, that they'd been miserably unhappy for five years trying to fix things around the edges and trying to sort of listen to clients without upsetting the apple cart. And, and this is the story of a firm, a litigation department head, who decided that actually he was done with that. He was 45 years old, he was head of the litigation department. Fortunately, a young chairman has, doesn't just have five more years worth of billable hours to find for himself and his team. He has at least 15 years worth of practicing ahead of him. And he was determined that the firm should differentiate their litigation practice based on really serving clients and really um, adding value as defined by the client. The challenge with that is they weren't sure exactly what that meant. So this is the firm I, I've tried to, I had to get these slides approved by the client and I've tried to like, make these as, as generic as possible. Um, the one thing about this firm that I'm really impressed with is that they actually haven't been publicizing what they're doing. They actually don't really want anybody to know what they're doing. They didn't do a story about how they're now the value-added law firm and how they've revolutionized everything and are doing it differently. They've really focused on kind of making improvements and really focusing on their clients and feel that the story will tell itself a couple of years from now when they've really made big advances in the area. So call it Stanton and Moore, 500 lawyers, 70% litigation risk management, 40% transactional, recognized for its trial and appellate work. These are really great litigators. They're the ones we call when you're really in trouble and they have really strong trial capabilities and they're very proud of it. But with that having been said, like many firms, year-on-year -year litigation, decline in revenue, profitability, and new case filings, this curve is so common with the litigation departments, almost all of them that I work with. This is what they're seeing. They're seeing fewer new case starts. They're seeing more cases settling. They're not seeing an increase in their work. And it's causing pressure. This is an interesting firm in that it has a transactional practice that is actually kind of a high-value transactional practice in some very niche areas. Areas. So they don't want to hear about discounting because they don't discount. They don't represent big companies. They're in a very niche area. They don't want anybody to agree to billing rates that they might be held to because the old rules somehow still apply. And I think you'll know as in some of your firms, private investment funds, some of that work that still applies to some hedge fund work that still applies to some small company, high tech work that still applies to. So this is a firm that is the corporate practices, transaction practice and leadership of the firm is really pressuring the litigation department, which used to be a big revenue producer, although not as profitable as the rest of the firm, to do something about this situation. 
So the question we started out with is, how do we differentiate our litigation practice to establish a competitive advantage? What everybody wants to do, right? And, and the question really, there's really only two ways to do that, as you know. You have two choices, and this is in every business book that you ever studied. You can either provide the same value as your competitors at a lower price, or you can provide greater value than your competitors at a higher price. But that's really it. Those are the two ways you get a competitive advantage. It's not complicated. It's very difficult to do. But the fundamental of it is not complicated. So of course, we started with, what does the marketplace look like? and what does the client value? As, as Tara was talking about, as Jim was talking about, this all fundamentally has to be based on what the client values. So we did some research and, and you know, some of this was designed to make them feel better about the fact that it wasn't just their litigation practice that was suffering, it wasn't that just nobody didn't, that people didn't like them anymore, that their clients didn't like them, that there's been just a genuine shift in the marketplace. And, Thank you, Jim, for these slides. Um, <laughs> the next three are from, all from Georgetown Law. Um, so I think you've probably seen these. Um, this comes from the Fulbright Norton Rose um, 2014 and 2015 litigation trend surveys. So one of the things that had happened to this firm is some number of years ago, a client, a consultant had come into the firm and said, you should jettison this labor and employment practice. You don't need that. That's low rent stuff. You shouldn't be doing that kind of work. You guys are big ticket litigators. Don't do that work anymore. Now, of course, that is actually one of the types of litigations that clients are most worried about. And while you have to be able to do that profitably, and it is very price sensitive, and it requires all the things that Jim and Tara were talking about in terms of technology and managing the work and, and outsourcing and, and handling things in a very value-added matter, if you're looking for revenue, that's not a bad place to be looking for it. Contracts, which they also didn't do, and regulatory investigations, which actually they didn't want to do. Their view was that they were litigators. And, and this comes to the talent model that Jim was talking about. If you have a litigation department that prides itself on being litigators, the people in a time when people want risk management and compliance, you are valuing the most highly your trial lawyers. You're promoting them first, you're paying them more, they're most proud of themselves, they're the big ticket guys, the important guys in your department. But the people that your clients want to talk to are the risk management regulatory keep us out of trouble people who can then cross sell in the big ticket litigators. So we kind of have it backwards and one of the things this firm really looked at is, oh my goodness, who are our lawyers who are actually good at that because we don't really talk to them very often. Maybe we should go find them and make sure they have important front and center roles with our clients. Um, this, this was another, this was kind of forward looking, what are the top areas of concern going forward. Um, so then the next thing we did, and we've done this with a lot of clients, and actually I think one of the first projects I did this on, Kevin and I worked on together, which is, so let's figure out, let's do a value proposition exercise. And so we'll, we'll give you these slides, because you can do this yourself, and I can send you the charts and stuff if you want, but look at what are the primary services offered by the practice group. So this is usually the stopping point for this discussion, because people say, well, what do you mean? Oh, you don't want litigation, you want antitrust. And I'm like, no, actually, I don't want antitrust, because antitrust is like six practice areas, and some of them are corporate, even though they happen to live in litigation. So as a result, you can't find a value proposition for your antitrust practice. Even that is too big picture for you really to develop a meaningful service delivery model and a meaningful value proposition for it. One of the other things that probably all the, of you that have had to respond to RFPs have seen is that actually your clients don't even bucket their service offerings in the same way you do. Every firm doesn't do that in the same way. So the idea that we're going to find a value proposition and really sell ourselves at the practice group level doesn't even communicate very well with our clients and it's something that we all have to work on. Now this will work, I mean this is in the baby steps of what has to be done. This is a good exercise to go back and talk to your lawyers about because you really do have to sort this. Clients buy products, they buy complex solution sets to specific problems that you offer and getting to the baseline of understanding what they are and who the, who the buyers are, who of the, the, each of those service offerings in a company is quite an undertaking but certainly worth doing if you're really serious about pursuing this. So anyway, we will go through and we have internally rate the strength of the capabilities, the investment related to make it a top tier practice, is it unique, 
fee sensitivity, projected demand, what type of clients highly value the service. One of the things I think that firms don't understand is that different ser almost, there are very few service offerings that offer no value at all that are completely commoditized. But my favorite example is big firms that offer mid middle market M&A services to ginormous companies is not a worthwhile undertaking. Motorola and Honeywell do not really want to buy your big ticket expensive middle market. They want to rent your associates if they're going to use you, but they would prefer to use a regional firm because they don't, those deals are not high value to big companies. However, to say that M middle market M&A services are not profitable and have been commoditized is actually not true. As you know, middle market companies value it, technology companies value it, um, private equity firms that exist in that space value it. So a lot of what we need to be looking for is targeting our services to the marketplace that um, that values it. And, and that's a really important exercise, especially when you're spending money to to develop business, right? So I, I'm the in-house marketing person and somebody comes to me and says, I think we, at the in the days of like the music business becoming digitized, Paul Weiss' partner actually comes to me and says, I think we should have a music practice because we do all this music part work. And, and it took a long time to kind of get him to the point like, well, what part of that makes sense for a firm like Paul Weiss to do? Which he completely agreed with when he looked at it, but they did actually have a profitable music practice, but it was in this niche that it was profitable. But the idea that they were going to do work beyond that was never going to work for a firm like that. Um, so three most significant research. So this is sort of the reality check stuff that we did. Who are the clients? What are the most significant research matters? What's their capacity size compared to peer firms? And what's the projected demand? So we used this to say, all right, you all ranked your services based on the, what you think the value of them is. Now let's go back and look at the numbers and say, can you name five matters? Then can we look at the profitability of matters and see if this practice really fits into that? So then, and, and this particular chart I can thank Kevin for. So we, then we tried to figure out how to map out all the service offerings. And so this is complicated and we'll give it to you, but we mapped out on this bubble chart, fee sensitivity, strength of practice, um, practice size, um, and demand. And what you look at, and so let's pretend that this is their litigation practice, and each of these bubbles represents some part of their practice. You can see at the top, the, the top bar, the, so if you're, you don't really want to be in that, so that bubble in the top left corner there, so their practice is limited and it's kind of moderate to high fee sensitivity. So should we invest in that practice? Should we really be particularly, or is that something that we're, either we need to figure out a way to do that much more profitably, but we're not, we're not gonna grow it. We have limited capabilities in that area at all. So if somebody comes to you and say, I have a great idea, this practice in this market, why don't we spend $50,000 sponsoring a conference to promote our capabilities in that area? The ability to have this chart really allowed us to make some decisions about what kinds of investments we were gonna make. But if you start looking at these that are in the top tier potential and top tier area, and then you look at them in terms of fee sensitivity. So for this firm, bubbles that were up here, practice their service offerings that were up here, we looked at and said, these are the ones we need to figure out a new service delivery model. We need to do this more cost effectively because we're great at this and there's big demand for this large bubble. We're a top tier practice in this area, but this falls in the category of something we need to do less expensively than our peers, but still do well. Okay, these over here that have top tier potential also have big demand. This one down here still has like low to moderate fee sensitivity. We ought to probably invest in that one. We ought to really be taking a look at that practice, that service offering and see what more we could do in that area. So the next step was to do what I call the client value visits, but it's really client feedback meetings with by a different name. Except when, I, when we do these, I either send the lawyers with a list of questions or I take a group of lawyers because all the questions are not report card based. They're all value based. They're all what do you value? And we look at them in two categories. One is service offerings and one is client service user experience. So that the service offering one, we really do like a deep dive into what are the things you really value about this service offering, about the way we practice? What do you really 
really want from us? How do you want to work this? Does this need to get cheaper? Does this need to get better? What, what is it you really want? And how much of this do you want to be doing in-house? How much of this should we be outsourcing? So that you have a really good understanding of what they see that service offering value delivery model is. And then the client, the user experience stuff is the type of thing that, you know, you learn all kinds of things, like how can we help you do your job better? And then how can we help you look better to your company? And how can we help the company? And through all of that, as Tara was saying earlier, through all the interviews that they've done and all the remarkable feedback that they've gotten that's helped clients, you can make a lot of changes. Some of it's little stuff. We had in one of the meetings somebody say, do you know what I really wish you'd do? Could you host a quarterly dinner for, uh, for me and my peers, similar peers in the industry, so we could get together and talk about how we handle certain things, and I was like, mm, I'm sure we could. <laughs> <laughs> when would you like to do that? So the types of things, when we do the value visits, we usually interview the secretary for the department, the most junior lawyer. We try to walk through their offices. And, and this is kind of typical when you do client interviews. You really want to learn what their experience is like. And if you can take a lawyer with you to do it and show them, well, look at that little cubicle over there. That's where the general counsel sit. And you know what? All five of them, they have one assistant to work with. And their technology is actually really terrible. One of the client value visits that this client did resulted in them sending their IT director. They seconded their IT director to the firm for two weeks to help them get their technology in place and shape and kind of help them develop forms and all the kinds of things they needed. Now, of course, the forms they were began using were the same firms that, that my client was using. And so there was quite good synergy there. But then they actually went to their other firms and said, this is how we'd like to do things from now on because we've sort of straightened out our, our practice in this area. So on the service offering side, and I'm just going to give you the general pieces of this, clients were looking for risk management mitigation strategies. When a big, they were really surprised to hear that when a big case hits, trial experience is most important, but they're likely to choose the big best litigator from firms that are already providing risk management and compliance services. That's a big change. But that a lot of their clients said, well, you know, this is the person that's been in here for a long time. They understand us. They know we, the way we do things. They know all the things that understand all the things we put in place to try to do risk management. So if we could have them involved and have the best possible litigator involved, that seems to us to be the best package. Now, they can't always find that. And for a real bet the company matter, they won't be able to do that. They really will have to go to a firm. But, but just so you can kind of understand their thinking, and this was, you know, so this is a firm that doesn't really do that risk management kind of compliance stuff. And it was really important for them to understand that they were narrowing the range of, of opportunities they were going to have to pitch because they weren't inside their clients with their clients all the time. So a lot of the confirmed secondary research finding on their key service areas of needs and gave, they gave a lot of insight into kind of service design and how to add value and how to reduce cost and the things they wanted. So one of the other interesting findings was this. Um, we did a round table, so a group of the in-house counsel that, um, that we were doing these value visits decided that they knew we were doing this with other people and why don't we just have a dinner so they could all meet each other and kind of continue the discussion, which got the firm a little bit worried, I must admit. But we had this dinner and we were six, you know, general counsel or heads of litigation in the room and, you know, sitting around the table all from different industries and we found so as they're talking, and they're talking about value and what they value in litigation services, what they, all they can talk about is that they, what they value is the preventive stuff that, these, that the firm does, that they value the advice, they value the risk management, they value all of that stuff. And at some point in the conversation, I seriously could not hold my tongue anymore. And I said, okay, so do you realize that the thing you value the most is the thing you expect the firm to do for free? And they all just sort of looked at each other and said, well, because that's what you're saying. I mean, you, you, you actually, a couple of them articulated that the reason they're willing to pay this fee at this firm, it's big fees, is because when they pick up the phone and ask them questions on other things, on preventive stuff, they get answers and they don't get charged for it. 
So one of the things this firm did, and they allowed me to tell you this, is they came up with a fee strategy that basically was, well, how about instead of giving you 30% off on your litigation services, how about if we give you a 15% credit towards doing the kinds of preventive compliance stuff that you want, so then you're actually getting value, but then we actually get credit for doing it. And you're, we're causing, we're creating work, we're, otherwise we're just losing the money. Why not keep our compliance preventive lawyers busy, get them in there, and then we'll be able to spot, we'll be there to spot this litigation. And a few of them have taken the firm up on that. So that's the, you know, when you get really granular about these conversations, you can really come up with some really interesting ideas of ways that you can get into clients and kind of do something about the fees and some of the other issues that we're dealing with. So this was the other thing, this is now my absolute favorite slide that everyone said, and this, is, this was in yours as, as well, Tara, but excelling at what your clients value means being bad at what they don't value. To be good, do bad. One of the constant feedback that we get in the value visits is put yourself in our shoes. If I call you and say, we've just got hit by this lawsuit and we have to deal with X and Y and Z, I generally, by the time I've called you, I need to call my general counsel like the next day to give them an update on what we're doing. And in some cases, I need to tell the COO and the CFO too. And I need to be, if I'm a bank, I need to be deciding whether or not we need to do some capital reserves depending on what time of the quarter is against this. What's, what's gonna happen? And there's all these people on me asking me what's going on. And then you all take two weeks to provide us with the perfect memo with absolutely all the facts and all the laws and completely spell checked and proofread 32 times. And by the time I get it two weeks later, I am so stressed out because I have been pushing people off, pushing people off, saying I'm going to get an answer. Now, some of this is a communication issue because the in-house counsel should be saying, so I need your quick and dirty three paragraphs about what you think we should do or a phone call. And I won't hold you to it. You can put all the disclaimers on it at the bottom you want, but I need to be able to go and say, look, these are the three things we're pursuing, etc. And most of the time, you're so busy being perfect and wanting to give us the absolute correct, perfect answer, the, you know, the, the Rolls Royce Ferrari way of doing things, that you actually don't do this. So this is, as both Jim and Tara were saying, this really important line of questioning about what do you want and what should be perfect and when should we get things done and, and when is good enough good enough and, and important and very difficult for litigators especially to deal with. I mean, I've had more success with corporate lawyers and regulatory lawyers on this. Litigators are find this um, challenging. So these are some of the things that um, that the firm is in the process or has put in place with their client at the beginning of every matter. This is like a scoping exercise, but client service expectations are outlined at the beginning of each matter, including diversity expectations for each team, which is very important to this firm um, and some of their clients as well. They do monthly progress reports. They do end of matter surveys at the end of each way. They do a value-based cover letter for invoices. So I made them implement this first because any firm I've ever worked with that has sent out a cover letter with the bill that explained exactly what it was, was accomplished during whatever period of time the bill was for, got so much less pushback on the invoice than if you just send them what you enclosed, re please remit the following, this was the total amount, uh, you know, uh, you know, hourly codes and tasks attached. It, it's, it's, it requires a lawyer to stop and think, but you know what, if you're already doing monthly progress reports, it really is the monthly progress report. It's not that difficult and that much work to do. Um, so those things they put in place, and it made a big difference right away. They were getting a lot fewer calls. They were getting a lot, it was just turned out to be a lot easier to get paid by some of their clients. They're doing value-based fees, much less hourly rate stuff. They were, they were in the process of and have done some of this, coming up with budget price modeling capabilities so they could actually sit down with a client and say, if you take this pathway, this is where the costs are going to be. If you take this pathway, this will be the costway. So there's just a commonality of understanding of where the costs are and how decisions impact cost. Um, 
they, they're, they're, as Jim was saying, I mean, an investment in technology is an important in all of this, and this firm, like many other firms, in order to keep its profitability high and keep raising its profits per partner, has sto had stopped kind of investing in new technology and trying new things. And so it was very difficult at a time where they're saying they need to increase revenues for them to be saying at the same time, oh, but you know what, in order to do that, we have to invest in all this technology. So they, what they tried to put in place, what we tried to put in place was a combination of investments and kind of short-term strategies with specific clients that would both get them more work and increase um, the profitability of those matters. Um, I, think, I think Tara was saying that, you know, she always asks about well, client work preferences, relationships, client backbounds. So their intranet now has client pages and everyone's required to go on the client page and read the annual re associates, everyone. R look at the client preferences, look at their assistance name, their birthdays, look at everything that they need to know to improve the working relationship with that, um, with that particular client contact and that client. And they're required to like read at least the beginning of the annual report so they know something about the clients. There's news clips on there. So if you're on the phone with, there's also a list of who else in the whole firm is working with the client because too many firms, the associate down the hall who they have lunch with every day is also working on the same client, but they don't ever talk about work. So they have no idea that they're both working with the same contact at the same client. So they did that. They improved their document repository and, rep and did and kind of some of their form documents made them easier to find. Um, and pricing guidelines and tools for modeling. And they started with more improved task-based billing. So results after six months, they had expanded client relationships and gotten a greater share of the work. They got improved realization and had fewer write-offs. Um, increased client referrals, net promoter score, as Tara was talking about, completely suddenly out of the blue getting calls saying, so-and-so said they were working with you on a matter like this and that you were really a pleasure to work with and you had these systems in place so we want to work with you. That was actually pretty dramatic. It happened pretty early on then made people like, wow, you know, people are really noticing that we're doing things differently. This, this differentiation stuff might have something to it that we should pay attention to. So that was really important. Important. One of the other pieces of that was teaching the lawyers to stop saying, talking about how busy they were. I mean, that's one of the things that I tell every lawyer I work with. Stop talking about how busy you are because no one is ever going to refer any work to you. Back to your point, they're going to be like, oh, I'm just so lucky that they spend any time with me at all and I get any share of their brilliance and I, I really want this person. I don't want anybody on their team. So, shh. I'm not telling anybody about it, but just sort of set, you know, talking to clients about, I'd love to do more about this, of this work, you know, what are you seeing going on in the market, et cetera, and making them the ally instead of trying to impress with them with how busy and important they are. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting that happened was there was increased selling of litigation by corporate partners. You know, everybody talks about this cross-selling and cross-servicing, but one of the things we always fail to do is tell the people who are the relationship partners that we want to cross-sell us what to say. You know, I have a great partner in corporate. Wouldn't you love to meet them? That's about all they know about the corporate partner's practice. So if you can give them things, so what we did was like a, a, a talking points about the litigation practice and the innovative things they were doing that the corporate lawyers could raise and, and could bring up. And there were different ones for different industries and different types of clients that gave them things to talk about. Um, and that did, I mean, that's been slow, but it started happening and it wasn't happening at all before. So just some kind of last slides on things that you um, should think about doing. One of the frustrating things is that a lot of firms are sort of talking the talk of doing all this stuff, but not walking the walk. And so very early on, you have to find champions within your firm who are really willing to roll up their sleeves and actually do this work. I mean, I was fortunate in this case. and in the project I work on with Kevin and, and some other cases to really have some clients who were like, no, we want to do this differently. We want to differentiate ourselves. I, I have one client now who's starting a project like this who thinks of his, he's the chairman of a firm and a re super regional firm and he thinks of his firm as this little pirate ship that comes in and steals work from big firms. Um, but you know, if you have that mentality, you're going to walk the walk and talk the talk. And he says that all the time. I mean, it's part of the mantra of the firm that that's who they are. And so so um, 
this is a big challenge in any firm, and it goes to what Jim was saying. This is my all-time favorite cartoon. I've probably used, I've been using it for 25 years, but give it to me straight, Doc. How many billable hours do I have left? This firm, like every other firm we're in, has people who are just trying to fill their plate with billable hours and the plates of their people around them. That's it. I have this many hours I need to generate in order to make my comp this year. I, this is the team of people that I need to feed. That's my goal. That's what I'm going to do. If this is your mentality, change the way you do things is probably not on the list of high on the list of things that you want to do because you're really just looking to kind of get by. Um, anyway, um, this is actually the favorite quote of, of this particular the, the litigation department head of the uh, firm that I work with. He says this all the time: the past guarantees you nothing in the future if the rules change. The Kodak example. <laughs> Uh, this is another one, and this is one of the challenges of working with lawyers. The, the, there's an infinite difference between doing nothing and doing something, and there's a barely noticeable difference between doing something and perfection. And this is one of the things, so th and there's nothing perfect about this project we're doing. There is pieces that have come unraveled, it's messy, some people haven't wanted to reach, reach out to their clients about this. There's no unanimity, unanimity in doing this project, but we are making progress. And they are seeing results and other people are moving along and so trying to trying to make it absolutely the perfect project and make it work and having everybody on board are probably things that will mean that you're really never going to get there. Um, a favorite Dilbert crown. At the beginning of this project, the project became so complicated in re-engineering the project so that like every little thought and every little piece and and every service offering in the whole department were covered um, was what the chair of the department had in mind. And, and we really did manage to strip this down into pieces. There's some service error offerings within litigation that have really not been touched. And there's some things that they really want to do that we really have not gotten to, we just haven't gotten on the plan. But you're not going to make any progress as you're busy building the perfect, incredibly complicated project plan. So important to try to keep it all um, reined in so that what you're trying to do is actually possible to accomplish. And that's my thoughts for today.